All right, just by way of uh, introduction, this interview is being conducted as part of the Appellate Court Legacy Project, the purpose of which is to create an oral history of the appellate courts in California through a series of interviews of our retired justices who have served on our court. Uh, as I just indicated, I'm Tim Reardon, uh, an Associate Justice, and we are honored to have with us today uh, the Honorable uh, James Marciano, who served on the first district, district from September uh, 1998 to March of 2013. And uh, as a personal matter, I want to welcome you, Jim, uh, as well as on behalf of the Legacy Committee. It's a great honor to have you here, and it's good to see you and see you doing so well. I feel honored to be here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Unlike uh, many of our justices, you are not uh, you were not born in California, <laughs> but I uh, but you were born in uh, in Detroit, and uh, according to my notes, uh, you left at a fairly early uh, early age and came out to uh, California. Uh, can you tell us maybe just a little bit about your family uh, in those early stages of your life and development? Actually, I, I'm the uh, son of immigrant parents. My father came over from Italy when he was uh, in his late teens and uh, ended up in Detroit with some relatives. My mother and grandmother uh, came over in 1912 uh, to meet my grandfather, Louis, who was an Italian coal miner, to get to go to a uh, road in Pennsylvania where coal miners were. And one of the nice things we were able to do is find on a website um, it's the uh, ellisisland.org. Anyone who came over from Europe between 1890 and 1920 is now on that website. I mean, and so there's, there's Russian Jews and Irish and a lot of Italians came over at that time. Most were so from southern Italy. My parents uh, were from northern Italy. They were Piemontese from Piedmont, Piedmontese, but Piemontese close to the Swiss Al Alps. That's where the Olympics were in, in Turin. Anyway, um, in that, on the website, it actually showed my grandmother, Margaret Bonfont. Uh, she was 25 years old, and in those days, the uh, clerks had meticulous handwriting, just like uh, court clerks used to. Right. So, so you could read everything on the manifest, and it's there in, uh, in the correct manifest, and it describes her as being 25 with this auburn hair, uh, no lice. She was not a communist. She was now not an anarchist. She had two do do dollars in her pocket, and she was meeting my grandfather, Louis. And with her was the six-month-old daughter, my mother, Rose Louise Bonfont. And it proceeded to describe her, and she too was not an anarchist or, or communist. <laughs> and so they did settle in, in Rilton, Pennsylvania. And then later my mother married my father in Detroit. There's an Italian connection there. And then there was an opportunity in Albany, California, to work for Wonder Bread, to be a bread truck uh, person, to have an area to, to cover. And that, and that area actually was large. It was Alameda County and Contra Costa. And so we, we, we lived in Albany for a number of years, a few years. And then he was transferred primarily to Contra Costa, which was growing into the Concord area. And that's how we ended up in Concord. My, my sister, older sister, and my younger brother, Mike, and I, the, the three of us grew up in Concord and have lived in Concord uh, since uh, 1952, up into law school, and uh, when I when, when I got married, yeah. All right, so that's I mean that's a very interesting uh, history. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to add that uh, when I was on the bench, just as an aside, I never talked about the immigration background. Right. And you know, some of the justices would talk about this. And there's one famous justice who talked about growing up on a potato farm in Oregon, <laughs> yeah, which is true and wonderful. Um, but I, I always felt that perhaps, you know, that's important and it established many of my uh, ideals, goals, and, and values. But I, I felt it was a family thing and that you should earn something on your own. It shouldn't necessarily depend upon the uh, immigration status. But I, I want to say I'm very proud to be uh, a first generation Italian and that all three of us went to college. My, uh, my brother, my sister, and I, and then, and then went on to other uh, other things in our lives. Like That's quite an accomplishment. And it's, uh, it's an interesting history. I was going to say that, uh, uh, so now you're in Concord and uh, 
You attended high school uh, in the East Bay or in Contra Costa? Well, well, actually, I went to a prep seminary. After, after the eighth grade, uh, I went to St. Joseph's College in Mountain View. Right. And, and it, was, it was connected to St. Patrick's in uh, Menlo Park. And the idea of the prep seminary is that you would go there for four years of high school and then four years of college later and then four years of theology if you wanted to become a priest. But uh, the, 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 the education was to uh, give you a, a well-rounded liberal arts education um, in, in preparation for that. So we, 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 we studied uh, uh, Spanish, Latin, ancient Greek, uh, chemistry, physics, trigonometry, uh, rhetoric, poetry, all types of world history, and, um, and then eventually I got my BA degree in, in philosophy through St. Patrick's College, stayed for a year of theology, and then left and went to uh, Bolt Hall after that. Yeah, right, I have a note of that, and I was going to say, I, my cousin Johnny Heilman, who I think you, you know, uh, used to visit him regularly at both St. Joseph's and St. Patrick's. Uh, John Highland was an Indian. We had four teams down there, <laughs> a very good athlete. He was also a, a very good in track, I remember. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. He's a, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, well, after, yeah, you, I, I have a note as well that you went to Boulder Hall, you uh, got your de degree and JD degree, <clears throat> and then you took and passed the bar, and you joined then the Bledsoe firm. Uh, in Oakland, as I uh, understand. In San Francisco. Oh, excuse me, San yeah, Francisco. No, no, that's right. Yeah, it was, it was Bledsoe, Smith, Cathcart, Johnson, and Rogers. When I was uh, at Bolt, one of the courses that I enjoyed was the trial practice and w wanted to do trial work, civil trial work. I was planning to go back to Contra Costa County to Concord. I had clerked for the district attorney's office when I was in law school and also clerked for Cole, Levy, and McBride, a very good local firm. Tom Cole was a supervisor. Um, Dave Levy was a city attorney for several cities, and Tom McBride had been the city att attorney for another. And that was also the firm that Sam Conti, the, fe the famous federal court judge, came out of. But they wanted me to come out there. But the 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 trial part of it was not um, was not what I thought it might be. In the meantime, the Bledsoe firm interviewed at Bolt and offered me a job and explained the training that I would get and the types of clients they had. And so I opted to go with the, the Bledsoe firm, which was about a 20-person uh, trial law firm doing a large amount of insurance defense work. But they had a broad range of clients, which helped to make my career. I mean, they, they, they represented BART. They represented Kaiser Hospital medical malpractice cases and doctors in medical malpractice cases, Safeway, a lot of products liability. So it was a wide range of work. And these were uh, men and women who actually tried cases. I mean, they were in court uh, at least three or four trials a year you know, that we would help prepare. And then they would pass down smaller cases to us so that I did actually end up trying a fair number of cases while I was in San Francisco with them. And, and Jim, you were there pretty much 1970 to 1978. Yes. And then you uh, joined the uh, prestigious firm of uh, a Crosby firm in Oakland. Right. And uh, there's a short story in that. By that time, Claire and I had moved, Claire, my wife, and I had moved to Walnut Creek, and we had three children. And uh, the work at Bloodsoe was wonderful, but it was stretching me thin. I was doing cases in Marin County, San Mateo, and felt it would be better to be in the East Bay. So several firms from Concord approached me about joining them. And I thought it would be good to go back to Contra Costa County, and I knew the judges, and I'd done some work for the bar out there. But then in the meantime, the Crosby firm also heard of my uh, possible leaving, and they uh, needed somebody to head up their medical malpractice division in, um, in Oakland. And so two of the partners came over, and we had several discussions and met with them, and it, it was a grand opportunity that I'm, I'm glad that I took. So I, I joined Crosby, Heafy, Roach, and May, um, and did, did trial work for them. Just as an aside, they were a small growing firm. Uh, there were about 30 lawyers when I joined them in 1978, and when I left in 1988, we were 150 lawyers. And our claim to fame was that we, we were the largest firm between Oakland and uh, Chicago, yeah, in, the, in, that sp in that space anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you joined the firm in 1978, yes. and you were there for approximately 10 years. Uh, in 1988, you decided to 
join the bench. Uh, that's, uh, he had an interest in joining the bench. Yeah. Before that, I had uh, taught, while I, while I was at Crosby Heafy um, and at, at Bloodsoe both, I, I, I taught a trial practice course. Guy Kornblum, who had worked with me at uh, the Bloodsoe firm, went over to become an associate dean, and he was teaching a um, seminar in evidence. It was advanced evidence for those who wanted to go into trial work. And it was a paper course in the beginning, and he quickly realized you can't teach evidence purely as a casebook paper, paper course that fits into a trial setting. So he worked up some evidentiary problems and then asked uh, myself and Joe Rogers to, to come over and, and teach a section to the students at Hastings. And we quickly saw it couldn't just be evidentiary problems. It had to be in, in the setting of a, of a trial. And so the course was set up that we would do individual problems, give them, uh, we, we would lecture on how to cross-examine an expert. We would lecture on 776 in trial or, uh, or taking depositions. Then we would have the students go through that. And we were very fortunate that some of the Superior Court judges from San Francisco, uh, Judge Merrill and others would come over and they would preside over these little vignettes at, uh, at seven o'clock as we, as we taught the students. And, um, from doing that teaching um, at both places, you know, uh, late in the evening or sometimes on Saturdays, I thought about, you know, becoming a judge and some of the students encouraged me. And then uh, a nice thing that happened when there was an opening in Contra Costa, several of the judges in Contra Costa County also said, would you be interested in, in, um, in, in an appointment? And at the time, uh, Governor Duke Majin had just come in. He was a Republican. And, uh, and I think rightfully he wanted to make some changes. The uh, philosophy of the court had gone one way uh, in, in, the, in the 70s, as you well know, Tim, because you were in the AG's office. Um, and so, but, but anyway, but I was a registered Democrat and a lifelong Democrat, and I'd done civil law. And he was more interested in the beginning in, a, in, a, in appointing people uh, from the district attorney's office. But we, um, I'll wait for your next question <laughs> and explain what happened. So I, I did fill out an application, um, you know, at the encouragement of these people, not thinking anything was going to come of it because of the, the civil background, and I was a Democrat. Yeah. You're like me, a Duke Majin Democrat, because uh, the go Governor Duke Majin yeah. appointed me as well, and uh, I am a... Democrat, but you mentioned Guy Kornblum. He's a classmate of mine at Hastings, so oh. I know Guy very well. And uh, well, then then you would know Marvin Baxter <laughs> and <laughs> and, uh, and David Van Dam. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. They were all classmates, I think. Together. Yes, they were. Right. In fact, we had an interesting. <laughs> I don't take too much time, but uh, Marvin yeah. Baxter interviewed me uh, when I was being appointed by Duke Majin and. Uh, he, he, he said, I see you went to Hastings. I said, uh, yes, I did. Where did you go? He said, I went to Hastings, right. too. And it was such a large class, mm -hmm. uh, we right. figured it out. I did not know him at the time, right. but uh, by the time we got through the interview, I felt I got to know him pretty well. Well, let me pick up from there just a bit. Um, I had a couple of strokes of, of, of good luck in terms of the appointment process. I had been active in the Association of Defense Council, and the, the president of the association the year that I was on the board was from Fresno, Lowell Carruth, with a wonderful firm down there. And another member was um, Jack Chinello, and he was from that area down there too. And they, they heard about my application, and they both said, Jim, you know, we think you might be a good judge, you know. And I said, well, I'm not sure what's going to open the door up there right now. And then Lowell says to me, he said, well, I, I know Marvin Baxter, and I'm on his committee down in Fresno in terms of uh, local qualifications for, for judges. Let me talk to him. Right. And then Chinello says to me, I can go one step better. I have season basketball tickets behind <laughs> Marvin Baxter at the Fresno game uh, for, for, for the Fresno Bulldogs. And, and Baxter's a diehard sports fan, as you know. Yes. And he said, let, let, let me also contact him. And then one other thing happened. I had a huge case um, that took many months. It was a legal malpractice real estate case with some high-powered attorneys. And one of the attorneys was from Martinez. Um, but he had represented Reineke, uh, when Reineke was the lieutenant governor and had problems, ethics problems, and, yes. and that type of thing. So, and a very, very, Jim Cox was the attorney's name, very good lawyer. Well, Cox, unsolicited, 
sent me a copy of a letter in which he was uh, uh, recommending somebody for a judgeship. And then in the last paragraph, he said, I've worked with Jim Morishano on these cases, and he would make even a better candidate. <laughs> and and uh, that, so, uh, yeah, it was very nice. And so through, through, through that, it caused Baxter, Mar Marvin Baxter, who was the appointment secretary, at least look at the file. Then he called me up for the interview. We had, and you know how he is. He's low-keyed. He wants to know what's going on in the local community. But he has a way of finding out whether you love the law and how passionate you are about it and, and whether you'll be diligent and also your philosophy a little bit, but, but, but without going into uh, philosophical qualifications. So we, we, we had a very good interview. And then at the end, I said, well, do, do I have any chance at this? And he said, well, all things being equal, if there's a Republican and a Democrat, we're going to re appoint the Republican, I'll tell you frankly. And I said, well, I'm not changing my party affiliation. <laughs> I said, that, that would be hypocritical. He said, he said, don't. He said, well, just wait, something might happen. And then nine months later, out of the blue, I get this phone call from him saying, are you still interested? We'd like to appoint you to the Superior Court in Martinez. You know, the, we've, we've heard good things about you. Would you be interested? And then if I can add just a footnote to that, at the time, I was earning a very good salary at Crosby Heafy. And uh, the starting salary for a judge then was $96,500 in, in, in 1988. A, a good salary, but I had four kids on their way to college. Uh, they, they, they were, uh, you know, grammar school and high school, and they were, they're all, they were all college candidates. So I sat down with my wife to look at our finances <laughs> to say, can we do this on this salary? And she was only working part-time. And so what we did, we ended up refinancing the house so it would bring down the interest rate. And then with the money that Crosby Heafy paid to me to buy out my interest in the corporation, it was a legal corporation, I bought zero coupon bonds that came due, hopefully, the freshman year that each of <laughs> them would go to college. Uh, but it wasn't until, I would say, 12 years later that with, just, uh, with uh, Chief Justice George efforts, that the judges, as you know, began to get those good pay raises. But it took, me, it took me about 13 to 15 years to get back to the salary that I had at Crosby Heafy when I started. But I never complained about it. And I, I never, and, and I told other judges that, or people that would apply, you shouldn't complain. You know what you're getting into. And it's really an opportunity to do public service. And the public service and the, and the uh, interesting cases of working with, within the community really is the offset against, uh, against the salary considerations, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, so in 1988, you were appointed by uh, Governor Duke Majin, right. our friend, yeah. uh, uh, to the Contra Costa Superior Court, and you served uh, 10 years uh, on that court. What kind of assignments, I assumed you did a wide range of... Right, uh, when I, <laughs> as often happens, uh, I was an appointment late in the fall, so some of the assignments had been made. The uh, civil fast track had its four or five judges assigned. Eventually, they wanted me to get into that area because it was, it was my background. But I also wanted to learn criminal law because I wanted to be a well-rounded judge. Well, the first, so my assignment was general trials, meaning you do mainly criminal trials, and then if the civil judges needed help, you, you would back up on the civil side. And so my first case on the Monday after I'm sworn in on Friday is this robbery case. And um, I still remember um, that the uh, defendant had a prior conviction. And the public defender made a motion to, to, to sever that. And th they weren't helping me out, and they weren't helping each other out. In fact, there's some antagonism between the two offices out there. So I, so I spent the whole noon hour researching whether this could be done. And I came back and I said, you know, I found this case, People versus Bracamonte. And, and, and they both kind of laugh out loud because the Bracamonte motion was well known to everybody. You know, <laughs> but at least I found the right case. <laughs> yeah, granted the severance. <laughs> but, 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 but I was fortunate in that Judge um, Arneson, Richard Arneson, had been on the bench out there. And he kind of took me under his wing. And he would meet with Doug Swiger, wonderful judge who came to the Court of Appeal, and myself, Every morning at 7.15, we'd have coffee with him. And this went on for years. And in my case, I would tell him, I'm going to have some stupid questions about the criminal law or questions about sentencing so we could be uniform within the, within the county. And so he would answer all these questions patiently. And I'd run things by him about what I thought I was going to do. And so I, I did criminal trials for about four years. And then they switched me over to fast track. And we were the only truly true fast track 
court in Northern California. We were set up like the federal system. Each of the four or five judges doing that uh, had cases assigned to him or her, but handled all those cases from beginning to end. And this, this led into something else. Um, a couple of the judges had, who had done that assignment weren't quite as efficient as perhaps they should have done, been. So there's a backlog of about 800 cases when I took over that uh, caseload. And so what I did, I started uh, a mediation program. And, the, and, and I mentioned this because this mediation program was actually adopted by other courts. Uh, the, the AOC also used it. And um, eventually it led to my being uh, state trial judge of the year for the entire state. But what it was, was that on the morning of trial, I would schedule three trials or four trials, hoping some would settle. Uh, some would, some wouldn't. And looking at the one case that I was going to try. So then, so then I decided to bring in the special mediators on the morning of trial. And these are attorneys that I knew who were very effective and who had the respect of the bar. And they would come into court. The program was called the SMART program, Special Mediators Actively Resolving Trials. And so I would swear them in in front of the parties to make it uh, look very formal sure. and then send them out to meet with this, uh, to meet with the parties to see if the case could settle and to and explain that the, the cases m might not all get out. Well, th that program became su successful. So then, uh, as an adjunct to it, I said, we need also to have some courtrooms where we can assure people that they would get out. So we, we started, I started a program where the trial was no more than five days. And if they would waive the jury, I would get an experienced uh, trial attorney who would be sworn in as a pro tem. We would provide the clerk and uh, the bailiff, and they would have to, uh, the parties provided the, the reporter. But it was called Trials on Time. Uh, and these were little, they, it was the TOT program, because these were little trials, but important cases that would be no, no, no more than three or four or five days, because the lawyers were donating their time. So we got rid of some of the small stuff that way. Then I thought, well, we're doing this at the, at the back end, we need to do it at the front end and pick up some of these cases and try to settle them uh, before, before they get to trial. And so I was lucky to have an intern from uh, Davis and I had a, a law student. So I had him do an inventory of all my cases. I wanted to see what, what do I have, what's the estimated length of trial, and how many were automobile cases. Well, it turned out 40% of the trial of the uh, filings were automobile cases, and of those 40%, 80% were worth less than $50,000, so they could be sent to arbitration, as you remember. So then I, I knew the insurance companies, and it was Allstate, State Farm, Farmers and AAA insured 90% of these defendants. So I got them to agree to go into early, um, early uh, mediation, and it was called the EASE program, <laughs> Extra Assistance to Settle Early. They, they had all these acronyms. that The, the bar loved it. But to, so, so we would get lawyers to meet with them and get these, and it was mainly auto cases, to get rid of them, or they would go to arbitration. So that cleaned up cases at the front end, and we went from the auto cases to commercial cases, to a wide range of cases and have this kind of model for, for, me, for mediation out there that, that, the, bar, um, that the bar really was uh, very, very effective in. And it still is there, although they called me two years ago saying that the judge in charge of the program now doesn't like those acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're just, that's, we're, so we got rid of them. And I said, it doesn't hurt my ego. Um, but as I said, then, then Alameda County came out to check on it. San Francisco had a backlog of cases and they, and they wanted to do something similar. Uh, and, then, and then the AOC heard about it too and, and, and incorporated some of our concepts into mediation programs that they, that they were teaching. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm actually quite, quite proud of that. Yeah, you should be because uh, it sounds like a very good uh, system. And well, it worked. It, it from scratch. Right, and it didn't cost anything except the lawyer's time and my time late at night. Uh, and then what I would do too is that I would stay to settle cases, and, the, and they knew this. If, uh, in the morning, um, I would get in at uh, 7.15, meet with Judge uh, Arneson until 8, uh, have coffee going for the lawyers, and would do uh, motions and sentencing between 8 and 9 o'clock, do my jury trial from 9 to 4.30, and then bring in cases that needed special attention to settle, and work on those from 4.30 until they would settle. And sometimes I would stay. 
you know, seven, eight, or nine at night because I didn't want the cases to unravel overnight. And I'd call home to a very understanding wife that I'm going to be late, late for dinner. And I, I remember one night we were there and I lost all track of time. It was a big um, condominium uh, defect, uh, construction defect right. case. And I had the homeowners come in because I wanted to get the case settled. And I began smelling pizza. And I said, well, what's, what's pizza doing in my courtroom? And the, the head of the homework says, 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 Judge, we're hungry. It's 8 o'clock. <laughs> so we sent out, sent out for pizza. But it turned out the case, the case did settle. So, so I did that over a period of time, too. But there's a method to my madness. You know, I wanted to get rid of those cases and get those cases behind people. Well, so it sounds like something. you're very effective in, yeah, uh, so, in doing so that. that. Right. Well, let me, in 1998, now you yeah. You've done your thing in the trial okay. court. All right, I'll tell you what happened there. Yeah. Um, in the mid-1990s, some of our senior judges retired, and so they moved me back to the criminal side. And we had a, a number of death penalty cases that needed to be worked on. And so they asked three of us to be the death penalty panel. It's uh, Flyer, Judge Flyer, Judge Patsy, and myself. The AOC provided grant money for a clerk for one year. And it was interesting, she had clerked for Broussard. So she, so she brought uh, the Chief Justice, or Justice Broussard. Yes. So she brought a certain bent to, to what she wanted to look at. But they brought her so she could help us with the pretrial motions. And in return for her assistance, she was going to write a death penalty handbook. Uh, the trial bar, uh, the trial bench did not have that. So we, we, were, we were working on that with her, having standardized voir dire questions and then handling Phillips motions and certain motions and, and evidentiary problems. And then as motions came up during these trials, we would work with her and she would be like a research attorney for us. And we also had other heavy cases. So they, they assigned me to do that. She was only there one year. It was a $50,000 grant, which was not a lot of money uh, for an experienced attorney in, in the mid-1990s. She ended up being the uh, head research attorney up for the Sacramento Superior Court. Um, so, but we didn't have anybody to do that afterwards. So, so I continued then helping to put together some aspects of that trial book and then, um, and then trying some cases. So in my last year, in 1998, I ended up trying three death penalty cases in 16 months. And, and my goal was to do it fairly and dispassionately, very, very important cases, to make sure the jurors understood the system, and they did understand this, the importance and the solemnity of it because of the nature of the, of the charges, but to start on time and finish on time. And I would work with the lawyers a year in advance, and we would set a trial date. And I said, I'll handle all these motions in advance, but we're going to start this case on, on time. And in jury selection, we're going to get a jury within a week, a week to six, uh, you know, five to seven days. It's not going to take all month. We'll, we will use questionnaires that you've helped design. I'll do a lot of the examination. I'll give you time to ask questions also. We'll go through the hardships. And so we, so we developed a methodology. And so the cases all did start on time and finish on time. And I think that the jurors also, uh, you know, learned, learned about the justice system, learned about human nature and, uh, and, the, and the importance of, the, of their serving. You know. Yeah, that's quite a, I mean, that's quite a feat, uh, three capital cases in, uh, in Yeah, I, I had done one other uh, a couple of years before. In fact, it was with uh, Bob Coakley, who later became, yeah. it, was, it was his last case. He was the assistant DA that was out there. It was an inter interesting case uh, in which uh, this defendant had killed three women because they um, didn't follow his code. Uh, it was cold-blooded killing, and then he had a history, too, of uh, uh, trying to kill a woman in uh, Nevada and some other things. But he ended up, uh, he wanted to plead guilty to the charges and then try the penalty phase. And, the, the, and his, his uh, lawyer was good, but had some mixed emotions about that. And I still remember there was an excellent article in the Notre Dame Law Review that covered that subject, and so, so we went, so we covered that, and so, and then took a very careful plea, naturally, uh, because of the nature of that case, but then it was tried mainly, uh, mainly on the aggravating and mitigating circumstances sure. on the, uh, on the punishment side of the, of the case, and it was an uh, interesting case. He, he was found, uh, the, the, the jury found the uh, special circumstances, found the death penalty. I reviewed it as you're supposed to, looking at the evidence at that time, and that was like in 1994, and it wasn't affirmed by the California Supreme Court until, until 2004, and now it's winding its way through the federal court system. Yeah, A long history. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, this is basically in 1998, and uh, 
at that time, uh, having done so many things, the, uh, you, you decided to seek an elevation to the Court of Appeal. And I, what happened on that was um, uh, Gary Strankman had been elevated. He was from our court. In fact, I took his place in Martinez. And there, there were several openings, and, and Mike Phelan was over here, too, from Contra Costa, both wonderful judges. And they um, suggested, you know, you might apply. And there, there are these openings. And I'd, done, I'd been a trial judge for 10 years um, and tried all types of cases over there in settlement conferences and pretty much didn't help the bar, was active in the community, pretty much had done what I wanted to do. So I, so I filled out the application, and again, I was a Democrat applying to Pete Wilson. Right. And, um, and the, uh, it was, uh, oh, it wasn't, it was, wasn't uh, Davis, uh, Davies from San Diego was his appointment secretary, and he was very good. And he, he interviewed me, and it was a very, very good interview, and he noted the party difference, et cetera. And then, and then I was fortunate enough to... Uh, uh, to, to, to be nominated to, to the position and, and the bar. The bar was very supportive. Uh, since this is being taped just for posterity, I, I was, uh, I was uh, found exceptionally well qualified uh, that time. And again, when, uh, when the presiding judgeship came up a few years later, my, 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 my claim to fame is that I'm the only one who was appointed by uh, appointed by Republicans as a Democrat, both to the you know, Superior Court, Court of Appeal, and then later on the presiding judgeship that was with uh, Gray Davis. Yeah, yeah, I was not right noticing that irony. Yeah, you're right, anyway. <laughs> well, uh, you, you are in 1998 appointed by Governor Wilson, as you've indicated, and then in 2001, uh, you were appointed by Governor Gray Davis to the position of presiding justice of Division One. There's a yeah, small story there. Um, Gary Strankman was a wonderful administrative presiding justice, as you know, as well as being a presiding justice. Uh, he had started a different methodology for reviewing cases, and um, one that he wanted continued, and one that he had turned uh, Bill Stein around on, and Bill, Bill was very much in favor of it, and Doug Swagger, who was in our division, was also in favor of it. So we wanted to continue that system. I was willing to, do, to refer to Bill, to defer to Bill and thought that he should be the PJ. He did not want the position and both Doug and Bill asked me to uh, apply for it so that we would keep the, keep the same system. Um, historically, in 1917, and Reardon's saying, what, what's he going back to? <laughs> There's the wonderful, wonderful Irish uh, judge, uh, Lennon, who was the presiding justice of Division I. And as you know from, the, uh, from this legacy program that started from the centennial celebration of 1905 to 2005, there were various uh, historical retrospectives that we did. And the Court of Appeal started in 1905. Before that, we didn't have a Court of Appeal. And there were only two divisions up until 1917, Division I and then later Division II. The uh, Supreme Court was getting all of these industrial accident cases the uh, predecessor to workers' compensation. This is part of the progressive legislation. And so they were inundated with cases, and so they began dumping more cases back down onto the Court of Appeal. And some, oh, and at that time, you ran for the position. It wasn't until 1934 that the position of a justice on the Court of Appeal became appointed. And so you ran by party, and so you had certain people, if they're running, they're, they're running for good reasons and bad reasons. You have good workers and bad workers. Well, within Lennon's division, they were getting behind. So he, um, he started the conferencing. And he says, I'm giving each of you X number of cases. We will meet on this date. We will discuss these cases. And then by the following month, I would hope you'd have many of them written up and you know, very, very short opinions. But by uh, making it accountable and setting dates like that, he helped clean up the backlog. So Division I had done cases like that and then kind of got away from it. And by the early 19, around 1990, and you probably remember this, there was a two or three year backlog here at, at the Court of Appeal. And it was serious and, and it became a kind of a, um, a whip used by people to get cases settled. There's no sense appealing. You'll be up there for three years. And Strankman realized that that was wrong. So when he, he had worked with Jim Scott 
on another division, I think division three, or Scott had, had, had this method in mind that I'm about to explain. So when Strankman came, he pulled in all the cases into the division. Some of the cases had sat downstairs. All of them were pulled in. He got a, a handle on how many did we have, and then split them up four ways among the, among the four justices, and then said, we will conference these cases every two weeks, picking up from where Lennon had stopped. And I want you to, each of you, summarize the case that you will be authoring. And then the other two justices who are on that case can ask questions. We'll try to reach a consensus, and then we'll meet with our research attorneys and give them some direction based upon our conferencing. And by making that accountable, he cleaned up the backlog. It took four or five years and a commitment by the judicial assistants, the secretaries, as well as the judges to do that. Well, that's, that's the method that we were using when, when I came. And, and it made sense. Um, I, I had two wonderful research attorneys that I inherited from Bob Dosey, uh, Lynn Armstrong and Pete Beckwith. And the, they, were, they, they were used to this system. And so the, the judges, oh, 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 and also what Strankman did, he counted the number of cases that would come in each year and then would split it up into every two weeks we'd have to uh, pool X number of cases to stay current. So sometimes our draw might be 16 cases, 20, 22, depending upon the number of cases uh, that were pending, and then they, they would be split, split up that way. So you, you would meet with the attorney after the conference, explain how, at least the way I did it, I, I would explain how I wanted the case written up. This is my rationale for it. I would give them the research that I, I had done, give them books from the library and from my office, case citations, and then I would tell them this is a five-pager, a 10-pager, or a 20-pager. I wasn't holding them to that, but I was trying to explain the 20-pager was much more complicated. Sure. The five-pager, you can probably cut right through that. We don't want a long opinion. Essentially, that's, that's what I was telling them. Then they would come back during the process and they might say, well, judge, on the summary judgment, I'm not sure you got this right. <laughs> you know, I, I was looking at the declarations and maybe we should approach it this way. And then I would look at that and then, uh, then send a memo around to the other judges saying that we're going to change our approach for the following reasons. Look at my draft and the reasons for it. If you disagree, let me know. And then the, the attorney would give me a draft and then I would sit down to make the draft my own and then pass it around to the other two justices uh, for their comments, and then it would be put in pre-oral argument form. And so, and, and so we did things at the front end. And I've had some justices will say, well, that's, that's a lot of work. A and uh, at one conference, one of the um, judges said, well, aren't you taking away the fun of the hunt? And so I came back and asked Lynn Armstrong, am I taking away the fun of the hunt? She said, judge, I'm not a hunter. Please, <laughs> please continue doing it the way you do. It keeps us on target, and we like to do it that way. And so then after uh, Gary Strankman retired, uh, then the, the panel wanted to continue doing that. And so I, I said, I'll continue with, with the same process and, um, and became PJ uh, uh, and it went from there. Yeah. That's right. You were elevated uh, to the presiding justice by uh, Governor Davis. Right. And uh, keeping your nonpartisan uh, uh, practice in order. Uh, did you, and you kept this, did you, if you were going to point to one person who was kind of influential or instrumental in the good that you accomplished as presiding justice, I assume that would be probably Justice Strankman. You learned a lot from his yeah, style. Absolutely. I was also blessed just with you know, my the rudimentary values that Bledsoe Smith, the lawyer, the attorneys there, besides being excellent trial lawyers, they were involved in community affairs and, and taught. And at Crosby Heafy, very prestigious firm, but uh, Ed Heafy taught at Bolt, Richard Heafy taught up at USF, uh, Chris Gasperich uh, was, was active in uh, trial practices in the medical malpractice area. And they, they always encouraged excellent work, and they would review your work. And then as, as a partner in the firms, I had as associates assigned to me, but I'd also be meeting with the partners. On, on the quality of the work. So I would say that those firms also influenced me, uh, you know, to, to a great degree. And then, then Judge Arneson, who's a you know, wonderful judge, and then, and then Strankman, as you said. I, I had one interesting experience, I think it's worth commenting, that uh, you, you don't know about, and only a handful of people do, with uh, Governor uh, uh, Davis and uh, Bert Pines, who was his appointment secretary at the time. There was an opening in the Supreme Court, and um, there had not been a Latino judge, 
and there was not an African-American uh, uh, judge at the time. Um, oh, in fact, the opening was when um, oh, the justice went, uh, uh, they went to the uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Court of Appeals. Um, oh, uh, Janice Brown. Janice Brown, you're right. And, and she had been an African-American, but there, there, there was that opening. But Davis had just been appointed, and you had um, 16 years of Republican appointments at the trial level. And they were looking for some candidates, and they wanted some trial judges or Court of Appeal justices. So they were looking around, and, and he wanted to appoint a Democrat. The, he had appointed two Democrats in um, Fresno, in the 5th District. And so their names were available. And when my name came up for the presiding judgeship as a Democrat, there had also I had some very nice laudatory letters by uh, the appellate bar and by various organizations. And so uh, a couple of uh, important people said, well, Morishano's a Democrat. And so Bert Pines calls me up and he said, would you, I said, we're, we're considering you for this position, I'm going to interview for that, would you be interested in the Supreme Court? And I said, well, I, I said, I'm not sure if I'm worthy of it. And he said, well, uh, we think you are, um, and I'd like to ask you some questions. In the meantime, Carlos Moreno's name had been floated, <laughs> and the newspaper articles were, were glowing, and it was true. He's a wonderful, personable, uh, somewhat liberal judge. He fit the mold that... Uh, uh, that uh, Gray Davis would want, and it's pretty clear he was, in a, he was going to get that appointment. Everybody knew that he was going to get it, but they wanted to have the process of looking at some other people. So I answered a few questions, and then I said to Pines, I said, am I really a viable candidate? I said, if I'm not, I'm not going to put my family and friends through all this and the press and the whole thing. You know, I, I, I said, I, I see the handwriting on the wall here. Finally, after some prodding from me, he said, well, we do have one person in mind. <laughs> and so with that, I, I said, well, why don't you consider the other couple of Democrats that you have with him, but uh, don't, don't consider me for, for that position, and I would be very happy to be considered as PJ of Division I. I said, that would be quite an honor, well, uh, you, you know, for that. But uh, That's an interesting uh, yeah. <laughs> story. I, uh, and I think I mean, we appreciate your mentioning that. It kind of gives you flavor for your own uh, integrity and uh, cooperation that's uh, marked your uh, term on this court. Uh, I, when, when you first became PJ, I, I think you've maybe already answered that question, or did you make any major changes? Did you pretty much follow it? Uh, we pretty much followed it. Uh, Justice Margulies was appointed, and she's very diligent and liked, liked the methodology. Uh, her judicial assistant had been used to doing it this way sure. from before, so yeah, so it, it, it worked. And two things happened uh, during this period of time. Um, the number of cases at the Court of Appeal began to go down, and this made our work a lot easier. When, when I first started in 1998 up to maybe 2000, I worked weekends as well as during the week because with our system I had to read my briefs and also read the briefs of the other judges that I was assigned to so we could have an intelligent discussion at our, at our conferences. So it meant that I was doing a lot of reading because we had a heavy caseload. Well, for many reasons, and I'm going to get into that in a minute, the, the, the caseload began to go down. And so what, what we did um, after Bill Stein retired uh, and with, 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 his, uh, with his successor, instead of conferencing um, twice a month as we were doing, we would conference once a month, and instead of conferencing every case, what we would do is the justices would pick out cases they wanted to conference that they felt needed input, or if they'd been reading the briefs on cases that they were assigned to but not authoring, they would also say, well, I'd also like to discuss uh, Marciano's case in this area too, because I've got some ideas about that. And so because we didn't conference every case, and because, um, the number of cases had diminished, we could do this once a month. The other thing we did too was on writs, and this was controversial in the beginning with Susan Horst, who had been the writ attorney for years, and who's a wonderful writ attorney, as you know, but does things her own way, uh, and, and her own way usually was, was the right way. Well, we, we used to do the writ conferences weekly. Well, I began looking at this, and I said, we don't need to do it weekly, and I said, if we do it every two weeks, then judges can arrange their own personal schedules in a better way. You don't have to worry about uh, missing, missing a conference. And so we began doing the writ conferences 
uh, every other Wednesday instead of every Wednesday. But then if urgents came in, emergencies came in, or something needed to be discussed, we would meet in a group. It wasn't necessarily kept for that conference if it had to be decided before that. So, so it was modified a bit, but we did keep the case methodology of reviewing the cases in advance so that we would reach a consensus uh, ourselves, or somebody might have a dissent or might have a country. Uh, sometimes what would happen is at the conference, somebody would have a different viewpoint, and I said, well, let me see if I can work that in. Well, let me see if I can modify your, right. your thinking about this. And so it, it made for a more balanced uh, opinion writing, although some, there were a handful of cases that, you know, we just had uh, disagreements on, which is healthy because it's good to get various viewpoints, yeah. Well, again, I just uh, having checked the, the record and the background and everything else, uh, from 1998 to 2013, uh, Fran, uh, our librarian, uh, head librarian, has kind of counted up the number of uh, published opinions that you personally authored, and I think the, it may, there may be more, but uh, she had you at about 160 uh, published opinions. Uh, and you did these opinions in addition to your administrative duties as the presiding judge of uh, Division uh, One. So do any of those, uh, maybe two or three, uh, stick in your mind? I know many, you yeah. probably have many in mind, but uh, in the interest of time, we probably should well, I, I can go through all 160 if you would like. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more than that. What we can do is rank, rank the greatest Notre Dame running backs of all time. We'll, go through, we'll start at number one and go to number 100. Um, I don't know. No, no, I, we, there's, there's two things about, about the approach within the division that I'd like to comment on, and, the, and then I'll answer your, your, uh, your question directly. Um, the district as a whole, and this was my perception as, as I was here, uh, was, did not reverse as many cases as were reversed in the 1980s and the early 1990s. And there's many reasons for that. Uh, one, at least in our division, when I was uh, giving some words of wisdom to new people that would come in, if you start with the California Constitution, a case is supposed to be reversed if it's a miscarriage of justice. So there has to be something significant that infects the case, goes to the heart of the case. And then we have our standards of review, the abuse of discretion, um, you know, and, 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 and other standards, the um, beyond a reasonable doubt, and then per se reversibility if it goes to, you know, a constitutional issue. But a lot of it is uh, simply harmless error under the Watson standard. And because a number of trial judges, like yourself or myself, were appointed to the court, we can appreciate that every trial is not an A-plus trial. Some trials are, you know, C, C-plus trials, B-minus trials, but they're done fairly. And the trial judges worked at it, the, um, the attorneys have worked at it, and even though in my day I would meet with the attorneys every morning before trial would start to say, do you have your witnesses lined up? Are there any motions, any surprises? So I, I would be prepared myself. The same thing at noontime, I would bring them in 15 minutes ahead of time to try to make sure that we would iron things out. But despite that, you know, things have a way of, of coming in, and so no trial is ever perfect. But, but the recognition of that is that, that not every trial needs to be reversed. And so the, 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 the reversal rate on the uh, criminal side was probably uh, maybe 5, five or 6 percent, and the reversal rate on the um, civil side was probably 10 percent, 12 percent. And these, these are much uh, different from what, what it had been before, but there was a, there was a reason for that. So then, so then in, in my approach on these opinions, I was starting with these, these, this, these principles and, and looking at the record in those big cases myself. I also wanted to write an intelligent opinion uh, that would be understood by a layperson or by, by the litigants if, if they were involved in the case. As you know, <laughs> we've had, uh, well, there's a handful of Supreme Court cases where they get into some difficult issues. You end up reading the, the opinion two or three times, reading a page two or three times. Is that right? That's <laughs> so, very true. True. Yes. And, 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 and it's puzzling. But that shouldn't be that way. The, 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 the English language should be straightforward. And so I wanted to write opinions that 
made sense and that, that people could appreciate, the man on the street could, could appreciate and follow this. But I would reverse, if the case called for a reversal, then, then, then it should, should be reversed. I also was blessed with good research attorneys, um, Pete Beckwith, Lynn Armstrong, Paul Kenny. I ironed out the kinks that he had from your division <laughs> when he came over to ours. Paul's a good man. He's a good man, a good writer. He's a very, yeah, he's a, a very, and then, and then at the end, Renee came over, Renee Torres came over from the 6th District uh, to work with me at the end. They were all good writers, but they also knew my style. And, I, uh, and, in the, in the, and in the second area, too, is that I always viewed opinions as collaborative. And it doesn't always work out that way because I sat in other divisions when there was a conflict and would make suggestions, and sometimes the suggestions were accepted and they weren't. But my, my position was that if I sign off on, a, an, on an opinion, even when I'm not the author, my name is on there. And I really uh, reached the position that I did because of a, uh, letters by a lot of lawyers who had respect for the work that I did as a lawyer and as a trial judge. And they had certain expectations. And if they saw my name on a, an opinion that was kind of odd, they would say, well, Jim, why did you sign off on that thing? And so it should be collaborative, even though it's, uh, you know, the, it might have been uh, Stein and Swagger and Marshanna with Stein writing it. You know, I, I, should, I, I, I should want to approve what is there. And we were lucky, at least uh, during those days, that sometimes uh, Stein would say to me, well, sit down with my research attorney on this one area of civil law. You may know it a little bit better than I do, and, and you can work out a, a, a change in the opinion with uh, Julia Partridge. And so we would rewrite it. So anyway, the point being that if your name goes on it, whether you're the author or whether you're the second or third judge on it, it's part of your product. And so that also affected, you know, how, how I approached it. And then, then the other thing that was interesting, we went to a um, appellate seminar. You were there uh, about six years ago. And they brought in these uh, uh, writers and research attorneys from Minnesota and other places. And one of the suggestions they gave at the end of the day, and some people were headed out the door to the golf course and didn't always pick up on it, but it really made good sense. And this is what I tried to inculcate in, in our division, and some of the people would do it and some wouldn't do it. You should try to understand the case by the first paragraph. It used to be the, the judges would write, this, this is an appeal from the granting of a summary judgment, and we're going to reverse it because of this. And then they would get into the facts down below and get into the history of it. What was encouraged and really worked was to look at it historically, look at it at the trial court level, and look at the issues. And it was very simple. If you had a, um, um, a fraud case, somebody bought a home, and was claiming that the house wasn't what it was represented, that there were uh, defects in the, uh, in the foundation. Uh, and, and anyway, so it would start up that John Jones bought a home from, Smith, from the Smiths. After getting into the home, he found these problems as follows. Uh, he tried to um, recover from them. They refused, so he filed suit. The trial court, the, ju the jury found, so you have fact the facts. Right. Then the trial court, found for him for the, uh, and, and awarded X number of dollars. The defendants have appealed because they feel the verdict was wrong in this way, one, two, and three. So you've got the facts, and you know what the case is all about going into it, if you follow me. And, and yeah, yeah, and it made sense. And uh, you know, I, I never quite thought of it that way for, for about 10 years when I was on the bench. And so gradually we, we were trying to do that in some of our opinions also, changing it around. Now, you, you were asking about the opinions, they're all, and we, we all say this, but it's true, Tim, and, and I think you and I are, are very similar in this way. Each opinion is really important, whether it's published or not published. It's important to the litigants, and they should understand it. it and it's important to move the cases as quickly as we can to get the litigation baggage off their backs because people get hung up in litigation way beyond what they should, and they should really go on with their lives if they can and get that in back of them. And that's one reason why uh, the, the handling of cases in a timely way is very, very important. And that's really our first and primary job on the court. You know, outreach and uh, writing and other things are important, and, 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 they're, and, and they're good outlets for judges. But our, our primary responsibility is to get those cases out on time in a fair manner uh, so that people can, can go on with their lives. So all of those cases were important, whether it's a Wendy case that came up uh, by a, a uh, public defender without any real issues to look at, unpublished opinions, um, 
we had some unpublished opinions that we went back and forth on, should we publish them? We tried to be conservative there and, and not publish more than 10% within the division. We would get requests from the parties and look at those very carefully, and if there was a reason to change our minds, we would. But um, the, the one case, I, I guess, I, I think it is over, it was the, uh, the Messerly case was one of my last cases uh, involving the BART police officer. And it came up on appeal with both the um, victim's family feeling that what happened in Los Angeles was unfair and then the police officers association and their counsel that represented uh, uh, Messerly feeling was unfair on that side that it was an accident. You know, that when he pulled the taser and used the taser instead of his, um, uh, we thought it was the taser and pulled his, uh, his firearm. And we, we, we looked at that case very carefully. It had some significant issues. They brought in several appellate lawyers for Messerly, but after looking at the whole record and substantial evidence and what the law is and, and distinguishing civil rights cases where they had some defenses that they wanted to raise, um, we, we wanted to write something that was uh, understood and very careful. And it was not an easy situation for the BART police when it occurred. So when Beckwith, Pete Beckwith wrote this up with me, I said, we want the timeline here. We want to do everything. We want the, whoever reads this to understood what went on that night, not what the newspaper said, not what that snippet of the video might have shown because there was much more to it. So we wrote that case with, 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 uh, with some, some care so that, it could be, so that it could be understood. Yeah, I thought it yeah. was very well written, uh, understandable. Yeah. Yes, yeah, section by section with lead-ins and explaining why, why we, why, why, why we did, did what we did do. And I, and I tried to do that really on a lot of my cases you know, and tried to be that way. We had one whimsical, maybe whimsical is not the proper adjective for a judge, but uh, it was a cable car case um, involving the turntable down on Powell. Right. And a worker got injured and um, he wanted to sue under some exception. And the, the question was whether it was real property or personal property, and that would change the statute of limitations. So I sent Beckwith to the cable car museum. I said, once you get all this history of the cable car for me, and he did. He was willing, and then, and so, so the first part of the opinion actually talks about uh, Halliday and the, the cable cars that were first drawn by horses up, uh, up to Knob Hill, and then how it evolved into the uh, Muni system and into the system today, and how the ta turntables were actually put together. And the, uh, so it had some good stuff in it, but at the end, and it was Beckwith's idea, he, he said, I, uh, we, uh, now that we've reached this verdict, we are ending this with uh, two, two, two rings. And two rings means for the conductors when they have those contests that they're very well satisfied. <laughs> and, but but it, was, it, it was clever, but it was fair. And, 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 and you have to be careful in, in, in using humor. You can't, um, you can't make fun of the lawyers. You can't diminish the issues. But sometimes you can, you can put a little bit of that in there. And, and, and that was the case. And then that year uh, when, when we were exchanging Christmas gifts among the staff, <laughs> Beckwith gave me a cable car ornament <laughs> for, for the Christmas tree, but that was anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So we so we did have fun, and, and, and we had and we had cases like that, you know, that that you would dig into, and yet and, and, and they were time consuming, but uh, but you liked writing uh, writing them. Yes, no, yeah. that was uh, mm -hmm. I, I recall that opinion very well, yeah. and I enjoyed it. I'm Back on the record, and. Uh, I had <clears throat> some kind of concluding uh, areas I wanted to cover because I know you're very knowledgeable in these areas. Uh, you've been very active uh, in court administration uh, and judicial education. Um, could you give us some examples of the activities that you've been involved with? And well, I, I was on the, on the library committee. And people, <laughs> people will kind of laugh about that. It's, it's an interesting background there. When, uh, f for years, there were separate libraries. Uh, the Supreme Court had its own, as you know, and the Court of Appeal had its own. And when we were over uh, at the other building, Marathon. at Marathon, yeah. uh, and I first joined, I thought it was the strangest thing where I, had, I would go upstairs and knock on the door for permission to get entry into the Supreme Court library, and I was a justice who wanted to do research. And I said, are they, I said, are they trying to hide something from me? Well, f fortunately, um, the uh, Chief Justice and the presiding, Anderson here, and Chief, uh, the Chief Justice, and I'm not, it was before George's time, I think, or it might have been George, 
they said once we move back into this building, this is foolish, let's combine the two libraries and, and, and put them in one place and we'll have all the books and everybody can use them. But, but uh, because everybody's provincial, what they decided to do was have three, three trustees from the Court of Appeal and three just trustees from the Supreme Court serve as the board of directors and the chief justice would be the vote breaker and that was never needed. Uh, but there, there, there were difficulties that I, uh, with the let um, the Court of Appeal uh, librarian go and another one go and brought in uh, Fran Jones and there were a lot of difficulties there that Paula Harley and I had to work through. Uh, there was some litigation that we had to work through. I mean extra work that we did uh, and, and uh, some approaches uh, that we had. And two things that I did up, upstairs was Fran had a, Fran Jones who was the head librarian had the National Librarians Conference in Philadelphia. She wanted somebody from the board to go to give it her, to back her up and to give it some uh, luster. And no one wanted to go and she said, Judge, would you mind going? And, and she said, it, it'll, it'll be worthwhile. So I, I said, all right. Well, it turned out it was wonderful from this standpoint. The meetings weren't, but we, we toured uh, University of Pennsylvania Law School's library. And then we got a side trip from uh, Philadelphia to Washington, D.C to see the U.S. Supreme Court in the, uh, behind the scenes during the summer and to also look at their library. When we were at the U.S. Supreme Court library, they had this uh, title on this room. And I asked, what's going on there? And I said, are these lawyers? And they said, yes, but they're not the elbow clerks. They're not the clerks or the justices. These are reference and research librarians that are here all the time. And if a justice from the Supreme Court needs some articles or needs some help, on personal things they're available. If you need statistics on capital punishment, if you need to know the amount of tonnage going into Miami Beach, they'll gather all this material. And I said to Fran, you know, we could use something like that back here at the Court of Appeal you know, or and the Supreme Court. That we have things all the time. And she said, you know, that's a good idea. So I prodded her on that and they hired one um, person with a law degree who was also had a library degree to be the reference and research librarian. And from that, and then I was encouraging the judges to use them. And they turned out, at least in my case, on many, some opinions and some other things I worked on, they were very, very effective and they finally expanded, I think, to four and the Supreme Court uses them. So I, 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 was, I was very pleased about, about that happening. Another very simple thing was when we were at the Penn Library, they had all of the cases labeled by what was there, uh, whether it was civil procedure, federal procedure. So you just looked at the side of the case. I said, Fran, this is so easy. We need to do that because otherwise you're going up and down all those bookcases to find something. And so she came back and put everything in order and put, uh, put a table of contents on all the side shelves so uh, judges who aren't very clever can, can find out uh, what is there and, and, did, uh, and, and did some other things. Uh, just as an aside, I was working on a, a talk I was going to give and I had remembered Chief Justice Rose Byrd, um, who could be different, uh, had given a talk to the state bar in which she quoted Bruce Springsteen. And Springsteen was the uh, troubadour of the poor and the working class. And I, I knew there was something clever in it. So I called the research and reference people. I said, it's back in the 1980s, so I'm putting you to the ultimate test. I want you to find this for me. And sure enough, they did. I mean, they were that good that they found, you know, found the speech. And I can honestly say that they never let me down in, in anything that we were looking for. We also encouraged the legislative history that that was expanded um, because I, I suggested it. And Fran, I mean, Fran also agreed. And, and, and we keep a depository, as you know, of, of, of statutory uh, history up there. So those, the, those were some of the accomplishments there. I served on other committees, but the most important one was probably the uh, Jury Improvement Task Force Committee. I was asked to serve on that when I was at the trial court as I was leaving. It was comprised of several Court of Appeal people, AOC people, trial judges, and people with an interest in, in jury reform. And when I was on the bench as a trial judge, I mentioned I wanted to start cases on time and finish them on time. I would also tell the people that most of you don't want to be here, but I hope that after you serve in my department that you'll thank me for the opportunity to contribute to the justice system, to learn about the law, to learn about human nature, and you'll think it's a worthwhile experience. 
and then and then I had a method of explaining the voir dire or the or what we were going through. I would also try to be fair in the trial. I had a couple of trials where the lawyers would ask repetitive questions, and I would finally cut them off, and I would say to the jury, do you, do you understand what the attorney's been trying to get at? And they said, let the record indicate the jurors are nodding their head yes. Do you want him to continue in that area any longer? Let the record indicate they're saying no. <laughs> and the lawyers didn't always like that. But, but, but it moved the case along. We would set time limits on some of the civil trials. And this was for the jury. The lawyers would say it's going to take two months to try this product's liability case. And I said, no, I, I think you guys can do it in four to six weeks. What I'm going to do, I'll tell the jury six weeks, but I, I think it's closer to four. Uh, and I'll give each of you a week and a half to two weeks to put your case on. And you can make a motion to extend that for a good cause, and we'll do it. And I promise you that we'll be in session from 9 o'clock to 4.30 each day, so you'll have a full day. Invariably, in most of those cases, we finished on time, and it caused them to tighten up the examination of the witnesses so that it was clear to the jurors. And then I was very much interested in the waiting time. Jurors had to wait all the time. They were on standby. At one time, it used to be for two weeks if they were called for service. Uh, and then it went to one week, but you had to physically be in Martinez for a week if you're a doctor or a dentist or, or any working person. You know, that, that, that's terrible. So uh, the Chief Justice uh, put together this Jury Task Force Improvement Committee. What can we do? And after uh, numerous meetings with very good people, we had multiple recommendations, most of which were passed. One was to go to one day of jury service, which meant that if you were called for service, you would only go in for that day. And if you were selected for a panel that the case settled, they would, you could call in the night before and you wouldn't have to go in at all. And then you were excused for a year. If you were sent to a department and they didn't use you, you were finished and uh, the utilization rate would go up because you need to bring in more panels, but it meant that most jurors wouldn't, wouldn't even have to come in or would only serve one day. The second thing we did was that you would get two or three different forms of jury summons, and this would be confusing. So we worked it into one form. It also saved time in the jury, in the jury service room so that, and, and uh, uh, money for the uh, postage and all that. So it was one form that, that was comprehensive. Then the biggest reform was in terms of making the case understandable to the jury. So we had jury innovations. One of the, some of the innovations were things you might have done, and some were newer. One was allowing the jurors to take notes, and we would uh, make notebooks available. We had the instruction on that. You know, you have to pay attention to the witnesses, look at them, and the uh, trial transcript would supersede any notes that you might take. Leave them on your seat, and we'll lock them up, and no one will see them, but they're, they're available for jury deliberation. Well, I'd say two-thirds of the jurors like to take notes. It was their method from school or whatever it was. We'd also tell them you can ask questions, but you have to write out the questions, give it to the bailiff. I'll discuss it with the attorneys, and I may decide we will ask them or we won't ask them. You tell them you're not here as a detective or an advocate. You're not a lawyer, uh, but you might have something that's bothering you, so they, they could ask certain questions, you know, and about half the time I would show it to the lawyers and say, you, you can follow up on this if you feel it's important. You know, some of the jurors think it's important. Um, then they had um, the jury notebook itself where they could keep copies of photographs, the intersection, medical pages from the medical records that were very important. So they would have their own copy that they could annotate and they would leave that, their, uh, leave that in the jury, uh, on, on their jury seats and then have it available in the jury room. Another was the mini opening statement. You know, the judge would always describe the nature of the case. Some judges would just read from the information or read from the uh, um, complaint that, that was filed and it would be in legal terms. Well, we, we would allow each lawyer uh, two or three minutes as part of the opening session of voir dire to explain what the case was about. And the lawyers can make it much more interesting. And then the jurors would hear the explanation. We tell them it's not evidence, what the lawyer says, not evidence, but this is what this case may be about. And th that way then they could, it would, it, there, there, there were fewer excuses for hardship well, because the jurors would understand, hey, maybe this case is interesting. I, I want to serve on this case. Then, then on the jury instructions, all the jurors got copies of instructions. So these are all innovations. Uh, one innovation that somebody recommended and a few courts did uh, if you knew the case would go into the defense case, that there would not be a non-suit, they would sometimes 
asked to have experts juxtaposed, the plaintiff's expert and then the defense expert, so that you know, if you could do that, if you could do it economically and if the experts were available to do it. But there were a whole series of these, and, and so in the administrative uh, standards, uh, they were approved, and, and, and courts were encouraged to do this. Five years ago, um, they were busy at Martinez, and I ran into a couple of the judges that I knew. One was going to be on vacation, and I said, I said uh, I'll tell you what, I'll take a week of my vacation time and cover for you if you can assure me that one of these two cases will go. And I wanted to see how these jury improvement uh, ideas were working. And so I went out and tried the case, and we used these, it was a civil case, and lawyers, I, I should say lawyers were delighted to have me, because, well, I knew them, I know most of the bar out there, uh, and they know what my attitude is about starting on time and finishing on time, and it actually it worked, and they liked doing it too. So it just, and so I, I, I'm, I'm somewhat proud. It was a group of us that did this, but we all bought into it and, and thought it was a good idea to make service uh, understandable and user-friendly. So, so, so people don't feel like their teeth are being pulled out, you know, when they get that jury summons. Yeah, yeah. No, I think all those reforms that you've indicated uh, are excellent, and I think most of them have been adopted or being... One other one that's come up in the criminal cases is reopening closing argument, which what people thought was controversial. It was done in the federal system. It's been done in three cases that I know of, and it's been approved where if the jurors have questions or they seem to be hung up, uh, that the court on its own or if the lawyers suggest it, they can open up argument on that issue just briefly uh, to, to argue the issue again uh, to, to see if that can break uh, whatever the deadlock is. And, and according to Jackie Connor, who's a very good trial judge in Los Angeles, who's tried a lot of cases, she's now retired. She was on our committee, she was the proponent of that down there as, as I was up here. She tried it several times and it worked, it worked very, yeah, yeah, it worked well, yeah. No, that's true. Yeah, no. yeah. Well, that's uh, obviously a very important uh, aspect of the law because it affects so many people. I, I'm thinking primarily jurors and uh, if they can gain a better understanding of what's going on, what's happening, and the time constraints. We did a study out in Contra Costa, and the population out there was like 900,000 at the time. Uh, oh, one of the other ideas, Contra Costa is a large county, just as an aside. So jurors came in from Discovery Bay, which is out by Stockton. They came in from San Ramon, which was by Dublin. And they came in from Kensington. Believe it or not, Kensington is in Contra Costa County, so we, we would get professors from UC. But it would take them time to get in there, you know, and that's a major commitment to drive in every day. And it's also a commitment to, to give up the time. And I remember one farmer uh, from Oakley standing up and says, Judge, I don't mind being here, but use my time. The last time I just stood around. And I said, well, I said, if you serve, I'll, I promise you that that you'll, uh, that, uh, that you'll uh, use, uh, use, uh, use that time. So, yeah, it's important that... That the, uh, that the jurors are, are, are treated properly and fairly. You know, you know, out of the 900,000, 20,000 were called in to serve one year. They weren't all used, but with, between a huge panel of, say, 400 for a death penalty case or 200 for a, a sex molestation case that had a lot of exposure and that jurors don't want to serve on. Uh, but, but the point being that you have a captive audience of about 20,000 people coming in. The other thing we did, we also started a program, I was in the building where the jury assembly room was, a judge would go down at nine o'clock and welcome them and thank them for their that's service. Yeah, to, to, and explain that, that there's some waiting time. Or if the case settled, that case would go to that department and the judge then would thank them and say it wasn't for not, the fact that you were here probably caused the case to settle, and rather than just letting them wander sure. out and wander away. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, we tried to do that. We gave them uh, donuts and coffee every morning uh, after the, they they were conducted into the jury assembly room, so they wouldn't be out with the witnesses as they waited for the session to start each day. And then the bailiff would bring coffee, tea, and donuts in, you know, which which is a minor expense that we would bear. The judges bore that. But it was, it, was, it was just a little touch to, to, to uh, try to make the service easier. Right. Yeah. Now that's, uh, it's, it, that area has required a lot of improvements, and I'm glad to see that they've been undertaken. Uh, I know you've been very active uh, in your own community in the church. Uh, could you describe any of those activities? Okay, well, I, I was on the St. Vincent de Paul board 
which is a wonderful organization. Uh, you get your, a bang for your buck, very, very low overhead. Uh, and they serve the, the poor in all capacities in terms of uh, they, they now have job training, um, a, a component, the, uh, vouchers for housing for a couple of nights about families living in their car and their motels will, will take these vouchers, bags of food, food vouchers, and it's a wonderful organization. I've also been involved in uh, the, uh, um, the food bank for Contra Costa Alameda. Uh, and uh, I've been their MC for the comedy night, which, which kicks off a uh, uh, kind of a rivalry among all the firms to raise money and, and cans of food. And uh, we've had uh, various wonderful comedians uh, come in uh, that, 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 that will perform. And I, I, I tell one joke and, I <laughs> and, and, they, and they like it because I'm very awkward at it. And so it's a chance to have some fun with the judge. And, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and have done that. And then um, with the Bar Association, I've done programs for them. Now that I've retired, uh, they have Bridging the Bar uh, for the new admittees. They asked me to be the keynote speaker for that. And uh, I've done a series of articles um, for the bar uh, oh, about six years ago, they asked me to write a case on rough justice or some interesting case. So I, I put together a fictional situation involving this Judge Carlton in Department 47. We have a Department 45, but we don't have a 47. But did a, it was based on a composite case that we had been involved in, one of my cases actually that was over. And then with that, it was very well received. Then they asked me to do one the next year, so I did another one. So I did a whole series of those. And those have been, all been put into um, uh, a uh, published work. And what they do is give it to people that have done good things for the bar as kind of, kind nice. of a thank you. That's a nice touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's been fun. It's been fun doing it. It's been the Judge Carlton series with the same public defender running through it. One was on three strikes. One was on a conservatorship. Uh, one was... Um, on a, a legal ethics problem. Uh, one was on a, a case that it was related to something we had here, but I make sure I'm not commenting on, on any of those cases. Uh, it involved a fellow who um, committed a robbery and was in um, state prison for 10 years, always almost institutionalized, the schedule, et cetera, got out and within four days went back to the same bank, committed the same robbery, and the same clerk was still there and he's promptly arrested outside. And his defense was it wasn't robbery because he did, not in, he did not form the specific intent to permanently deprive the bank of its money. He wanted to get caught. <laughs> and that's what it is. So there's questions about the instructions and the expert and the whole thing. And the due to institutionalization, he couldn't live on the outside. He wanted to get back into prison. So the, the story it, it takes place elsewhere, but it, um, it, it says it's a win-win situation. If they buy the defense, then he'll probably get off, you know, with, with a lesser. If, if, if they don't, then he's getting his way <laughs> back into prison. So it's a series of stories like that, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you retired, uh, getting to retirement, you retired last March. year, March of last year. And uh, what, what have you been doing in retirement? Oh, okay. Well, I, the, the main reason I had, plan you know, okay, I had planned to stay on another year and as you know from talking to me privately, I had some health issues uh, come up in December and January. And I really needed time off, um, time to have some medical exams, t some tests and stuff, time for myself. And as PJ, um, I never took more than maybe 10 days vacation here or 10 there, never, never two weeks or 14 days. And my philosophy was it really wasn't fair to push off everything on the associate justices. You know, they didn't have that position and I was appointed to it, so, so I'll do the job. So we, we reached a point in January where our caseload was current. And as I mentioned before, the caseload has diminished by 25% in the last 15 years. Um, and, and one of the byproducts of that is from all these civil programs that very few civil jury trials uh, come to our court. And the number of civil jury trials has been cut by 80% in some counties. Contra Costa used to have 30 a year, they're down to nine. San Francisco used to have 70, they're down to 30. Alameda County used to have 100, they're down to 40. Because of ADR, binding arbitration, these cases are settled, so these cases aren't coming up to the Court of Appeal. 
the number of Wendy cases seems to be up, and at least 10% of the criminal cases, closer to 15% when I left, are Wendy's, meaning that they're easy to handle. They don't have any controversial issues. So, so our caseload was under control. Then we had a full staff, and so I, I, I wanted the time off, so I, I announced it to the, uh, to the judges and the staff that I was going to retire in three months. I'd continue working on some of the cases, and I was willing to stay on past the March 15th date and come back to work on some things that I had put together, but some things happened where, uh, and, and Judge Sepulveda came in and I found her in my chambers. <laughs> it was just like that, and so, yeah, and, and she explained she was asked to take my place, so with, with, with that then I, I, I left. Um, in any event, so then I did some of the medical things. I've done some things with the bar. The other thing that I'd wanted to do was to have time, time for traveling. And there's a wonderful program called Road Scholar. And it's not the roads in England, it's R-O-A-D. And it's an outgrowth of Elder Hostel. And they have a signature city program where we went to Memphis as the music city and the center of the civil rights movement. And for five days, uh, you're at a centrally located uh, hotel. It's, it's right around the corner from Beale Street, oh, sure. which is a rhythm and blues. B.B. King's Club is there. Uh, other clubs are there. But in the morning, a professor or somebody will lecture on the history of music for an hour, and then they, they take you out to Sun Studios, where Elvis Presley, uh, Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Johnny Cash first started. They, and, and they have the first rock and roll record is there. And it's a wonderful... Um, historical uh, walk down memory lane. Then they take you over to the Stax studio where rhythm and blues uh, with uh, Isaac Hayes and others started and they have all, all that. Then later in the day you go to Graceland naturally for Elvis. Then the next day you go to the Rock and Soul Museum that has all of the vignettes. And then across the street is the uh, Guitar Factory, the famous uh, rock and roll guitar factory. So, so we did that. We went to different places like that. Went to some historical places that were tied into music. Then the second half was on the uh, civil rights and uh, Martin Luther King had been assassinated at the Laurel Motel. The motel has been bought by the civil rights people and it's there and they have, the, the room is there. You walk up the steps, you actually look into the room, the bed is pulled back, the newspaper and everything is there as it was on that day. And then even more ironic, right across the street is this old brick building and the uh, bathroom window is partially up where uh, James Earl Ray shot Lincoln, I mean, pardon me, shot, uh, uh, sh shot Martin Luther King. Well, they bought the building. It's an old brick building that's been converted into the primary civil rights museum, not just involving King, but the whole movement. And so uh, we went there and, and to some other places, went to the Baptist church that he spoke at, uh, went down to where the uh, Memphis um, garbage people were. There was a garbage strike higher wages that, that caused him to be there. So it's really a way to learn about a city oh, yeah. and going to places that we normally, if I'd gone to Memphis, I would have done some of this. But getting the inside up close and personal from these very good lecturers and then, and then a guide is with us answering questions and gets you into all the places too. Yeah, so, so we did that and we did that in St. Louis. We're, we're planning to do that also in Ottawa and Toronto. That's, it's a, a three days, three days in each place. Then the other thing that I did was uh, 13 years ago, I'd gone to Cuba, much to the chagrin of Strankman <laughs> and others. <laughs> but actually, it was through Diablo Valley College, had a legitimate program. The Spanish department got a license to go. You enrolled and got one unit of credit and kept a journal. But it was a very good program run by a former lawyer uh, who's gone into global travel business and people to people like this, knows Cuba well. Anyway, 13 years later, he brought back the same program through DVC, and my wife Claire had not been able to attend. And I, um, I, I had not traveled overseas, and I call that overseas, because of some um, uh, leftovers. I, I had had prostate cancer and went through treatment here. I was at court, actually, and drove myself over to uh, uh, UCSF for radiation treatment and worked out fine until the end. Had some complications with which left me with some urinary problems causing the use of a catheter from time to time. So that, that uh, I was concerned about that. But, but in working this out, it's a wonderful uh, program he had in Cuba to um, Havana, Cienfuegos, beautiful town, and then Trinidad, a colonial town, and you met with some of the people there. Uh, and, and I wanted to compare the changes, and it's safe to go. So what we did, we were able to fly to Miami, stay overnight, 
and then the flight from Miami to Havana is less than an hour. And the hotel was always available, and then the guide knew about my situation, and, and it worked out well. So, but this trip to Cuba was fabulous. The music, the history, the people. I speak some Spanish and uh, went by the courts, which were all closed. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, you know, it was so, so, yeah. So yeah. So what we're uh, what, what we're trying to do is is use some of this time to travel. I have grandkids in Virginia. Uh, they're going to come out for the Easter vacation. We're all going to go to Yosemite together. And then later in the year, the whole family, I have uh, four kids, the two sons and two daughters, all the family and the kids, we're all going on an Alaska cruise. Yeah, so I've been doing that. The bars asked me to write some articles. I did uh, an article that was well received on uh, the uh, five unintended consequences of ADR. Uh, and this has been published in, in, in various places. I've continued to write uh, the uh, story involving Judge Carlton. Each year they've asked me to do that. Uh, and so I just finished one on a civil case that appeared in their, in their journal in, um, in February. Uh, and, and, yeah, so I'm keeping my, I'm not doing, I'm not doing um, private judging. I, I got calls from all of the services. They all know me. When I was on the uh, Superior Court, I did many, many settlement conferences for 10 years um, and, and had my own methodology and I would stay late. So the lawyers in the community know me. Uh, three years ago, when they shut down the courts uh, one, one or two days a month, I got a call from the civil fast track judge that said, could you ever help us with settlement conferences on our day off? And I said, sure, I'll call, carve it off and I'll use the holiday. So on, on every other Wednesday, we went out to the bar office and they gave me a couple of cases to settle. And I was able to do that for four or five months. But I, I don't have a burning desire to, to do settlement conferences anymore. I really got that out of my system when I was on the Superior Court bench. Our pension is excellent, and so you don't need the extra money. I mean, unlike uh, some of your colleagues that were here that, that we all know, and they're all wonderful judges uh, that, got, that got caught up in it and do good work. I mean, it's their work that has lowered the caseload at the Court of Appeals, because uh, the Court of Appeals is a funnel. coming. The cases are funneled up from the trial court to the Court of Appeals, but. Uh, all those big cases if, are, are, being, are going to, you know, JAMS and ADR and uh, Adjudicate West and other programs. Um, and that's why the, uh, on, the, on the article I wrote, one of the things I commented about the unintended consequences is that the, some of the significant uh, civil issues are not percolating up as quickly as they did years ago because these cases are settling you know, the cases that, that, that have these issues. But uh, we, yeah, between traveling and uh, family, uh, local bar activities, and I'll be involved in the uh, food bank comedy night in May and other programs I, uh, I keep busy. And, and, and there's a lot of personal things I put off around the house and you know the people will say how do you fill up your time and I said just anytime you make a telephone call to any bank or have to take care of personal <laughs> things you know it takes takes half an hour to, to, right. to go through it so anyway, no it sounds yeah. like you have a yeah a it, full it, plate yeah it, it's fine right now yeah, right it's great right. yeah. well as a member of uh, this court uh, and a member of the legacy committee I want to thank you personally for giving of your time and talents, and I mean that seriously, to do this interview, which will be of great assistance to the bench, to the bar, and the citizens of the state, and learning more about the judiciary of California. You have served this court uh, with distinction. You've been a good friend, and I appreciate you doing this interview, Jeff. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. It's been my, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Before we go off, I, I, I do want to comment. I, I was blessed to be surrounded by very good trial judges and then coming to Division I with, with Strankman and Stein and Swagger and then the successors there, uh, Margulies and, uh, 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 and um, Bob Dondero and Banky, you know, it, it, yeah. that's part of it, you know, because you want excellent work. And then I was blessed to have, as I said, the four research attorneys worked with me. And, uh, and, and knew, knew my idiosyncrasies <laughs> and put up with a lot of things. And then uh, Sherman F Fikes was there 13 years, for, no, no, 15 years with me, 15 years, yeah. yeah. And, and again, she put up with a lot because I was somewhat demanding, but it was, and then, then it was through the, uh, p working with people like you here on the bench that uh, made it enjoyable, Tim. So, so thank you, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, yeah, Jim, yeah. for doing this, yeah. and uh, you're held in the highest of regard uh, here at the court. Uh, in the community and among your other friends. So thank you for doing this. All right, thanks. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Uh, well, today's date is August 25th. Uh, 
And um, we have with us, we're honored to have with us again, I should say, uh, Justice Marciano, uh, the presiding justice of Division I, who has retired. And uh, for the record, we had a previous interview uh, of Justice Marciano, and at, in the course of that interview, I kind of explained what the Legacy Project was, so I spare the listeners or viewers uh, that, that introduction. But I do want to say we're honored to have uh, Justice Marciano again with us, and, uh, and we'll proceed on, the, on that basis, just by way of ex further explanation. Okay, I'm uh, honored to be here, and I'm honored to be with uh, the David Frost of the uh, first, first District <laughs> <laughs> conducting this interview here. Yeah, Justice Rudin, go ahead. Yes, and that would be David Knight, uh, and we're honored to have him as well. Right. David's been tremendous with the Legacy Project and videotaping all the interviewees. Well, I was going to say that uh, it's an honor to have you here again, and we appreciate you taking the time and uh, coming over and, and doing the, the re-interview. It's not really a re-interview. It's more of an addition to some of the things we discussed at the last interview that maybe will uh, emphasize or deserve some more emphasis. And I thought uh, in, in discussing it with you uh, via the email exchanges that um, maybe we could start with something I didn't have an opportunity of seeing, and that is the uh, celebration of the 100th anniversary of this court, which was held in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, I know you attended and were involved in that uh, anniversary celebration. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that because the Legacy Project uh, grew out of that uh, anniversary celebration. Mm -hmm. The um, Court of Appeal celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2005, commem uh, commemorating the beginning in 19 1905 with uh, one division in Los Angeles and a division in Sacramento and a and division one here in San Francisco was not division one at the time it was just a, a little three person uh, division in conjunction with that uh, we were asked to do some research at each of the districts and so uh, in this district um, the five divisions uh, designated somebody or some persons from their divisions to do a, a research on um, how the, their division began uh, some memorabilia celebrating that, some important people that might have been associated with it, some important decisions. And what was interesting about doing it, uh, from my perspective for Division I as, as a uh, presiding judge, it caused us to go back to look at the history. And we were the first division. And uh, at that time, three distinguished judges were appointed, uh, Hall, Harrison, and Cooper, Judge Ralph Harrison being the presiding justice, who had served uh, both on the uh, Supreme Court, was a well-known local attorney, and then came back to serve as a commissioner to the Supreme Court, writing decisions. And it was the commissioner's role with the Supreme Court that the bar criticized uh, these uh, kind of absent judges writing opinions for the court that led to the creation of the Court of Appeal to help with the, with the workload. Well, Harrison was, was a, uh, a distinguished judge, but San Francisco, and, and this is what we learned at the time, was going through one of its uh, turbulent political times when Abe Roof was the uh, boss who, who got control of City Hall, the government, the cable cars, property out in the sunset, uh, brothel downtown, and uh, even tried to get control of the courts. And, and in those days, the judges ran by party, and they were elected by the people. And in Harrison's case, Roof had blocked Harrison so that he couldn't run for office. And uh, somebody else who was nominated, fortunately that person lost at the, at the election, and then a, a new judge came in. But ironically, Roof was later prosecuted, and the appellate cases came through <laughs> this division. And needless to say, uh, Justice Cooper, who became the presiding justice after, uh, after that, was no admirer of Roof, who had gotten rid of his good friend uh, Harrison. And so that led to, to, to some interesting cases and things that went on. And Roof ended up actually spending time, which was uh, remarkable, uh, in, um, in um, San Quentin. Uh, and then ultimately re uh, released and filed bankruptcy. Uh, his cohort, uh, who was on the um, 
it was on the Board of Supervisors, who I can't remember, whose name I can't remember, uh, also served a little bit of time, but came back and ran again, and naturally San Francisco was re-elected. Uh, but, but it was interesting tracing that history, and then that also led us to a subsequent judge from 19, say, 17, 18, 19, in that era, an Irish judge, uh, Judge Tom Lennon. And Lennon, uh, by that time, the, the courts began to build up some of the backlogs that uh, some courts are famous for, and he was concerned about it. And he was the justice that started the conference system. Uh, he read about it in the American Judicature magazine, how other courts in other states had started a conference system that made the justices accountable. And by uh, giving certain number of cases and meeting on those cases at a certain date, they had to be prepared to discuss them meaning that those cases had to at least be in a posture uh, to, to reach some type of resolution and some type of uh, discussion. So he was the one that, that, that actually started the uh, discussion process, but it was through the, uh, this anniversary that caused us to go back and, um, and, and look at that, that brought out some old history for the court that, that, that made it very uh, interesting to us. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I, that Abe Rofe uh, uh, is quite an infamous person, San Francisco uh, history as well. So, uh, Just as an aside, um, when he was being prosecuted, uh, some member of the union that supported Rofe came in and uh, shot the prosecutor, uh, and, and that was a separate case. But then the new prosecutor that they brought in to continue the case and prosecute the, the other miscreants uh, was Hiram Johnson the famous progressive governor that led right. to the initiative process and uh, many favorable liberal bills uh, in, in, the, in the 1914s, 15s. But that's where he got his start, was, uh, was, was prosecuting uh, cases that ended up in, uh, in our division. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting history from that perspective. Uh, Jim, I know that uh, you and Division One have been very uh, instrumental and uh, in the educational front and uh, I know your division and you have personally uh, been involved in the educational effort uh, and you kind of summarize that for me in this email but maybe you could just elaborate a bit I know there have been not just educational effort in this country but abroad as well and uh, okay. um, We've always tried to do some type of practical outreach which would not dislocate the court. Some of the divisions have gone out to other counties, but that means having the uh, CHP go with, you, with them, having local bailiffs and sheriffs involved, and it's a, it's a, it's a logistical uh, problem. Uh, for us, we did two things. And we did it at the local level where we would partner with law academies at Richmond High School and Balboa High School with the uh, teachers who were there. We would send them uh, copies of the briefs of, of an important case that we felt would be of interest to the students. And then lawyers would meet with them, discuss the briefs and discuss the issues. Then they would come over to court to, and come to the Court of Appeal to, to see a case. And then before they would actually watch the case, one of the justices would meet with them to explain the appellate process and to explain standards of review and what they might expect that day without discussing the case uh, that, that they were going to watch. Then they would watch the case, uh, would watch oral argument and listen to our questions. And it was usually a case that was designed for high school students, you know, so the, uh, a subject that, that they should be interested in. And then afterwards, the lawyers would meet with them uh, for kind of a post-mortem uh, discussion about what happened and what they expect. And then once the case was decided, we would send a copy of the opinion to the, uh, to the teacher who would then pass out copies to the students so they could see a case from, from beginning to end. And um, we would do that in the, uh, in the fall and in the spring with um, uh, the Richmond High Academy, Balboa High, and, and some other schools. Then uh, the, the, the other outreach that was uh, remarkable uh, had to do with uh, some of the foreign courts that came here. While I was on the bench, the uh, International Judicial Academy uh, asked me if I'd be interested in going to an overseas program on international law. Justice uh, McAdams was invited, Justice Flyer. Most of the judges that were invited were federal court judges from, uh, from the East Coast. Anyway, in conjunction with that, I was able to go to The Hague and, and learn about international law. 
and then came back to San Francisco thinking that that was the end of it. But Jim Apple, who was the director of it, uh, wanted to uh, partner with some of the important courts from Asia. So he invited over the um, Supreme Court of the People's Republic of China. And they were coming through San Francisco and they were going to stay overnight here on their way to Washington, D.C. to go to some programs there. So he contacted me and he said, would your division be willing to host them here in San Francisco? And, yeah, and so they came over and uh, there was a, a Mandarin translator. We met with them, spent several hours um, up in the beautiful judicial conference room explaining the history of the court, how we function, the difference between the federal system and state system, our funding, and uh, in answering questions. And then that proved to be successful, so then they invited over the Beijing uh, Court of Appeal. The justices from the Beijing Court came by, came through the following year on the, on the same basis. Then after that, the court from uh, Tibet, it was the Tibetan Supreme Court. And what was interesting in that case, you know, the, uh, there's problems between Tibet and China. All of the members of the Tibetan Supreme Court were Chinese. There weren't any Tibetans, but they did have several younger women that they had tried to um, they tried to promote. They were most interested uh, in police brutality. The Messerly case and other cases had been prominent at that time and how that could go on and I could easily have argued with them about you know oppression in Tibet and the Tibetan police and all that but we, 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 we tried to handle that with, with, with some diplomacy but it was the same type of program with those, uh, with those three courts uh, when they came through. But then when they came through a fourth time, I called uh, the director and I said, really, I, I, I don't have that much time to do this all the time. And there were several Chinese uh, judges on the San Francisco Superior Court. So I, I put them in contact with them so the program could continue through them and um, I could continue with, 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 with some of the work here. But it was remarkable to have the Supreme Court of China here in, in this building asking very pertinent questions about our judicial system. Yeah. I remember when they were, were here. And uh, uh, let me ask you another area that you thought maybe deserves some emphasis was the uh, type and quality of cases that you've seen as PJ, but also uh, prior to that as a, an associate justice and how those the, ty the type of cases we've got uh, have changed. I started in, um, in this court in 1998. Um, and at that time, Justice Strankman was the presiding justice and I became presiding justice in 2002. And then I was here in until 2013. Um, when I first started, uh, our, our caseload uh, was uh, anywhere between um, 32 and 38 cases a month split up among four justices and we had to meet on a regular basis to keep on top of those cases. We were busy all the time and it was a wide range of cases that we were seeing. There, there, there were many uh, interesting issues that were percolating through the system. Um, but in the meantime, ADR was growing in the justice system uh, among lawyers and, and uh, trial courts. and. As a result of that and some other factors that I'll mention in, in a minute, the caseload began to uh, decline uh, from 2002, 2003, 2004 to 2010. It actually declined by about 25 percent. And there were uh, unintended consequences of that and it was also good. It gave the justices a chance to really catch up, um, a chance to spend time on larger important cases that we wanted to spend time on. But uh, what was happening on the civil side is that we were getting very few civil jury trials. Most of the appeals were motions for summary judgment or demurs that were sustained without leave to amend, and there weren't that many. So the, the civil appeals went down, which, uh, which was the big factor in, uh, in, uh, in the cases decreasing. But on the other side, as the, <laughs> as the number of cases decreased, the length of opinions seemed to go up. And we were trying to work on that in our division. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the makeup of the division changed. Some of the research attorneys changed. And you had newer judges coming in and we we're trying to uh, impart the importance of being succinct, clear opinions so that lawyers didn't have to read the opinion a second time to understand it. But uh, in, in talking with the reporter of decisions for, the, uh, for, for, for our cases, I asked him about that because it was my sense and so he looked into it and he said, I can't give you a number of words. 
He said, but I've looked at the computer bytes and that, and he said, it's really the cases are, the opinions are about 30% longer uh, than they were before. Not in your case, because yeah, you've always tried to be succinct and to the point, and it's true. And, uh, and there are a number of the old timers uh, that, that, that was their, their philosophy. But, uh, and, and, and I can't say whether that is good or bad, but that, that has continued up to the, the, the present time uh, where Occam's razor may not be used perhaps as much, uh, as, much as, a, as, a, as it should be. Then the other change was in the number of pro pers appealing. And that's because, especially in family law, it, it has become so expensive that in most of our courts here in Northern California, from which we receive appeals, uh, there's in, uh, in family law dissolution cases, in at least 70% of the cases now, uh, one side is unrepresented and it's pro per. And in 50% of the cases, both sides are pro per. And there are, there are those that are dissatisfied with the result who don't quite understand the legal system. So that we began to see uh, more pro per cases the, the other thing, the other phenomenon are the, the, the Wendy cases. And these are cases where a uh, lawyer, these are criminal cases where uh, defendants are entitled to an appeal and the appellate lawyer is appointed for them. The appellate lawyer will go through the case and the issues and then advise the court, I can't find any issues, but would you look at it independently to see if there are some issues that I might have missed? And if so, you can send it back. The number of Wendy cases, which do not require as much time in terms of writing, but do require the same amount of time of going through the record, uh, also increased so that we had more and more Wendy cases. And then the, the, the final, the other change I noted was the Supreme Court uh, began deciding uh, important criminal issues that had been percolating in the system, you know, where w one district had gone one way in, uh, in, in sentencing, uh, in parole, uh, a lot of areas, so that a lot of uh, criminal cases in a lot of criminal, those issues became decided. So we didn't have a lot of fresh and new issues. So the makeup of cases between 2004 and 2013, in terms of number, length of opinions, and I would say you know, quality to a certain extent. There are always ch challenging cases, you know, they, we know that, that there are uh, you know, the cases that require extra attention and, and, and careful writing and precise writing so the reader can understand um, uh, the basis for the for the decision, uh, but that, that I, I'll be I'll be candid. One of the reasons, besides health and length of service and other things that uh, caused me to retire, uh, was that it wasn't quite as challenging for me uh, towards the end, and, and we were relatively current. And, and so at, at, at that stage, I just felt it was time to move on and let somebody else you, you know uh, step in. I know you. Uh uh, I think uh, you indicated you, you value uh, the uh, judges that are assigned uh, to the court where there is a vacancy or uh, whether or not the PJ decides to have a vacancy filled with an assigned judge or not. Uh, do you have any current views on the, uh, the value of those assigned judges? Uh, using assigned judges to fill in while, while the... Uh, uh, while there's a vacancy. Well, we saw it firsthand. Um, Justice um, um, Swiger and Justice Bill Stein both retired within three months. Very productive, very good writers, um, outstanding judges. We were hoping to get an appointment, you know, within four months, five months, six months. And uh, so in the meantime, um, we uh, had uh, a pro tem appointed, and it was Judge uh, Dave Flynn from Contra Costa County, whom I know. They're very good. He had been a business attorney. He'd had, uh, he's worked on both civil and criminal cases while at the trial court. Very well respected and a good writer. So he came, but uh, his appointment was limited to four months. The trial court wanted him back uh, within four months. And that worked out for, for that period of time. Uh, we were able to handle it because we simply reassigned the research attorneys within the division. Each of the judges then worked with three research attorneys instead of two. And we also had a central staff attorney. And that worked out for that period of time. Then when he retired, uh, Judge Steve Graham from Marin County, who'd been a prosecutor, um, civil attorney, and then on the Marin County uh, Superior Court for a period of time, came over very diligent. And the problem is, though, that uh, with 
uh, with, with just the, the, the three of us, um, you, two of the justices, myself and Justice Margulies, had to be on every case and I had to always be available in terms of writs and matters of that kind because you needed two sitting justices. Right. The, the chief wanted at least two, 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 two sitting justices. Knowing that, there, there's no point in bringing in a fourth trial court or retired judge, and we were able to handle the caseload. The cases, the appellate caseload had uh, uh, diminished, as, as I indicated, and, uh, and Steve Graham liked the work, and he, and he had good attorneys. Uh, then, but it lingered on, went into an, a year, and then another year and a half. And then, uh, sadly, um, that was the time when I uh, developed prostate cancer. And, uh, and fortunately, I was able to do my, the, the radiation here in San Francisco uh, at UC, when it was actually on Divisadero, which is close to court. And I was able to drive myself there. People offered to drive me there, but I, I, I was tired, but didn't have any major um, major complications from it. When I went through it, it was uh, six weeks. But then at the end, I did, uh, and um, I ended up uh, with some uh, urinary tra uh, uh, urinary problems with my urethra, and I was at home in bed, and it's the first time I've ever missed any time from work in my life uh, with an indwelling catheter that you can cringe <laughs> when you sit there, you know, day in, day out. I was able to do some of the work from home, but you're in no position to do that. So we contacted the court for, for assistance uh, because, in essence, you know, I, I wasn't there day to day. And there was no assistance available because we were going through the budget crunch at the time. There was uh, no one else available. And um, uh, so the, the, the only thing that happened was that the, we, our, our writ uh, assignment was put in abeyance because a sitting judge and a regular judge, the two of them couldn't decide a writ. It would always take two sitting judge, judges, and I wasn't available to go through all those petitions with them. So then after about four weeks, I was able to get back to court, and we, we caught up a bit, um, and everybody worked very diligently. I was in contact with the governor's office on a monthly basis. And the, uh, the appointment secretary, I think was, this was during Schwarzenegger's, she kept saying, well, we're, 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 we're looking into it. We're looking in, into it. And then I had uh, other judges write letters. And finally, finally, they made an appointment. It was like 18 or 19 months uh, uh, you know, down the road. And I, I, I will say that that was a, a, very, a very difficult time for us um, in, the, in the latter part, you know, waiting, waiting, for these, uh, yeah, waiting for these appointments to, to occur. In the meantime, uh, because it was taking so long, some of the attorneys or uh, research attorneys were concerned about their position. So when there were other vacancies, they moved into those other vacancies to have a sure thing. We also had a very good uh, judicial assistant secretary, and uh, she, um, she applied for a job upstairs to the Court of Appeal because so much time had gone by, and she wasn't sure w what would be happening. So we were decimated in terms of the number of people, but as we sought help, help wasn't available. We, uh, we, we couldn't hire at the time, and, um, and, and, you know, yeah, and we felt the, the brunt, really, of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the budget problem. Right. Yeah. You, got, you got through it, though, uh, Jim, and uh, I know it uh, probably took some extra effort. And, uh, uh, well, we, 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 our division had a reputation, starting with Strankman, to get opinions out on time. And at one time, we were able to uh, get a waived case where oral argument was not requested, get the opinion out within three months of the filing of the final brief. And on orally argued cases, four to five months, which meant that these cases were moving through the system the way they should. And we had a, uh, really an, an emphasis on, on time as well as quality. Uh, in order to uh, get the litigation baggage off of these people so that they could move on, on, on with their lives. And that's really how the, how the system should be. As you know from the 1980s, uh, when you were uh, still <laughs> an attorney and then as you took the bench, uh, the, 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 time, uh, the time frame could be as much as two years, two and a half years for these decisions to, to come down. And, and it became kind of a um, uh, culture. Uh, the, the, it was just accepted. And, and, and really, it should not be that way. And so then later, when we didn't have the resources and we were slipping back six months, eight months, nine months, it bothered us in Division One. But then after we got our personnel back, we were able to, to move it up pretty well. Uh, it was still a matter of working with newer justices 
getting used to the system and trying to encourage them to write a little shorter, shorter opinions that, uh, that in, in order to work, work on something else, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, in you know, the course of uh, your many years as a judge and as an attorney, there's been changes. We've discussed some of those, but uh, do you see any uh, major change in the practice of the law uh, from the old days until now? I mean, do you? Well, the, the biggest change is the diminishing jury trial. Um, I've, I've looked at the statistics that the AOC has kept at the superior court level for our district. And for example, Alameda County uh, always has had uh, the most jury trials because of the size of the county. And they were at uh, around 130 jury trials, and that's a lot for, for all of the judges uh, around 1998, 2000. They're now at half of that. Contra Costa County was at 40 cases uh, a year, jury trials. They're down to five or six. And that's, it's, it's unbelievable because they have judges assigned to fast track, each of whom uh, is only doing one or two civil jury trials the entire year. Uh, that they're, San Francisco, the same thing has happened. The number of jury trials has been cut in half in San Francisco. Then the smaller counties, um, they don't send as many cases up here. So the, uh, the jury trial is, is, uh, is, is a lost art. Uh, lawyers are, are accustomed to settling cases, accustomed to going to ADR, to outside dispute resolution, and after a while, th th this becomes a way of life. And if you aren't trying cases, you aren't developing that ability. And to get good at it, as you know, um, it's like playing tennis or golf or some other sport that requires repetition, and uh, you get to know yourself and you get to know your, uh, your, your opponent by doing it on on a regular basis. And then part of it is just the cost of litigation. Um, when I was trying cases, I could go into the courtroom with one big briefcase. Uh, today they have their <laughs> cart, cart with multiple briefcases and lawyers pulling other, uh, other boxes, uh, boxes with them. And so uh, the cost has uh, skyrocketed and corporations and insurance companies are conscious of that. And so they're looking for ways to get out of these big cases early also based on costs of defense, that the litigation costs can uh, be so expensive uh, that, 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 that they're trying to settle cases. So on the, on, on the civil side, we have a really uh, diminishing, um, diminishing number of cases, but that's also led to a problem in the law that important civil issues are not percolating up through the system because these cases are all being resolved at the trial court level. And the ones, the issues we see, as I mentioned, may be on summary judgment, but we're not seeing the finality in, in, in terms of certain tort cases, contract cases. It's taking a longer time to get through the system and then get up to the Supreme Court for, for, uh, for a final decision. And then, and then the second phenomenon is um, the mobility of lawyers. When I was practicing, if you were with a firm and you were doing well and you liked the firm, you would stay. It was like a lifetime commitment. Uh, the, these were friends. Today, people move around every two or three years. One firm swallows up another firm. Uh, and, you know, the one time we could bark off Brobeck, Flugger, and Harrison, they no longer exist. Uh, Heller Ehrman, you know, they, uh, they no longer exist. And, 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 and these were, uh, you know, outstanding local Pillsbury, Madison, and Sutro. Is now Pillsbury, o no, it's Owens, Pillsbury Owens or something out of Boston. Uh, so th there's, there's, there's great mobility. Uh, and less loyalty uh, within the system, uh, and, uh, there, and the layoffs that have, have occurred. With the economy, uh, firms will shrink during hard times and expand during, during the good times, but uh, when I was practicing, we tried to keep everybody during good times or, or bad times. We felt a moral obligation. They have families. They're part of the family that we're part of. They're part of our family of working lawyers, and so we, we would do whatever we could to, to keep them on. That isn't true any longer. If, if there's a problem uh, and the senior partners and big firms aren't earning the big bucks that they expected, uh, then some heads roll. And that's a common phenomenon today, too. You know, we, we never saw that uh, some, some years ago. Yeah, yeah that, on this same point, <clears throat> just an aside, mm -hmm. uh, I have a very good friend who, out of USF Law School, went to, to Brobeck became a partner, and I don't know how many years he was down there. And uh, in talking with him, he talks about the firm 
like a family. And uh, mm. it's kind of sad to see that element uh, changing. Mm. Uh, but um, time marches on. I, I don't know if it's always for the best, but uh, uh, that's, a, that's, <clears throat> that's a reality that you've discussed. Jim, are there any, I know we've covered so many points, uh, first time around, the second here. But Why don't you take a look at my script? And, 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 if we, and if we've covered them, I don't want to take up your time. I, I just, your time is very valuable, and David has, uh, obli oh, no, there, there's one that we didn't touch on, uh, and, and it's there. Well, and, and, and David Knight, who works for the uh, AOC, uh, who works for the AOC should put <laughs> earplugs on it um, at this stage. I mean, I, I'm going to be candid about this. Uh, I was appointed in um, uh, 1988 to, to the trial court, Contra Costa County Superior Court. And um, at that time, uh, seizure was an independent educational system, provided education for judges. So I went to their program for new judges and it was outstanding. Uh, the, um, the, these are all good uh, judges, either the court of appeal level or experienced trial court judges talking jury instructions, motions, you know, how to handle cases, how to handle law and motion, very, very practical courses. The AOC was much smaller. It's probably at that time maybe 100 people. And, uh, and they were dedicated to, uh, you know, serving the judges, being available for research and, you know, backup. Somehow over the years, as both of us know, uh, the number of departments increased, uh, the number of services increased, until uh, finally in the, uh, you know, in the mid-2000s, the mid they were up to six, seven hundred employees with departments, divisions, graphics department, uh, passing out pens, uh, passing out calendars that celebrated the Chief Justice's important dates of his career. Um, really functioning more like a, 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 a corporation. And, there, there was, uh, and money was available. Uh, they, 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 they were well funded. Um, and then the budget crunch came, and you, so you had the tr Supreme Court, Court of Appeal, the trial court, all of whom needed funding, and then you had this other entity that was supposed to be serving the three courts, the AOC, uh, with large numbers of people, um, if you needed, uh, for example, I was on one committee and they were talking about bringing in an outside consultant. And somebody mentioned, well, what, why do we need an outside consultant? And they said, well, don't worry, this person is a, uh, an expert from Boston. And I said, well, how can you bring them in? I said, don't worry about it, we have the money to bring, to bring the person in. And they, they did have the money that year. Um, but some of that went on. And then, and then, then it came to a head when the court, with good intentions, and the AOC with good intentions, wanted a computer system that was uniform throughout the state. So all of the courts could communicate with one another, and so that we could go to a standardized e-filing. But it turned out, as, as happens in government uh, <laughs> prognostication, the original cost went up and was going up and was going up until it was into the hundreds of millions of dollars. And then the, the question be, uh, uh, was raised, uh, as we had this budget crunch, can this money be spent better elsewhere? It's, it, and it became uh, the, the equivalency of the uh, bullet train that they want to build from here, from uh, Los Angeles to San Francisco. It's going to cost billions of dollars. Um, and, the, and, and, and so finally, in, in response to that, as you know, um, the um, Judges Association uh, had long been supportive of, A of AOC and of the uh, Judicial Council and a member of the uh, judges uh, uh, organization also sat, uh, sat as an advisory person. Well, some of the uh, judges became um, disillusioned and so they formed their own group. Um, and I think it was the, the Alliance of Judges was the name. And there were a few in the Court of Appeals, not here, but in Southern California that became vocal. And then in Sacramento, Los Angeles, and some other courts that were underfunded they were complaining about the funding in the, with the AOC and with this computer system where hundreds of millions of dollars were supposed to be allocated to fund all of these programs, whereas the trial courts weren't getting the money that they needed. And we did lose sight of the fact that our primary mission, our primary responsibility 
is to resolve disputes fairly and quickly at all levels, whether it be at uh, the trial court level or court of appeal level. The court of appeal, we had the outreach that I've mentioned that I tried to keep in-house, but that had expanded where you could get, uh, you could go to other places and, 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 the, and they would pay for it. Uh, they had award programs. You know, the judge of the year where some judges were put on the committee with the AOC and they traveled to different locations to interview and select the, the winners of the judge of the year award. Now, that, that's not to belittle those who got the, those awards. Um, and then there were other programs that were going on that were superfluous to our core, our core responsibility. And so finally, in response to that, they did uh, abandon the, the, uh, the computer program, and there wasn't money for it in any event. Uh, but it caused a hardship at, at all levels. In our court, as uh, research attorneys retired, they were not replaced. As judicial assistants, secretaries, and they do more than that, retired, they were not replaced. And so we were working under great handicap. We had a judicial assistant within our division uh, who had two, who, whose both parents were terminally ill, and she needed to care for them. And so she was looking for time off, but was working with the judge that needed to get some work out. We didn't have any uh, substitutes to bring in. We tried to help her out internally. Uh, remarkably and sadly, her father died, and she had to then help her mother. Her mother died a week later. And so she was left with handling uh, the burials of these two parents and then taking care of the estate and keeping up with the work. And she became emotionally distraught. And I remember this, and I spoke with her every morning. And I tried to get help internally. And I said, you need to take several weeks off. And I tried to explain that to the administration, that she truly needs time off. And they said, she can have time off, but we have no one to replace her. And she's a diligent person who didn't want the work uh, left undone. And so she tried to juggle all this really with great hardship. And there were other examples of that going on within the court. It was really the, the result of poor managing by the AOC, overspending by the AOC, and finally they had to contract and some good people were, 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 were lost. I mean, David Knight's here today filming, and that, the, uh, that's a core activity, you know, filming educational programs that can teach judges. But there are many, many other things. If you opened up the directory of all of the departments, it, it, it read like um, a, a private corporation with all these divisions and departments and department heads. And, um, and, and, and so that, that was distressing to me and, and distressing to a lot of judges. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, I would like to uh, thank, as you have already done, uh, David Knight for <clears throat> being our videographer and uh, assisting in these uh, interviews by the uh, videotaping of them. So I, I know uh, your comments didn't reflect at all on uh, David in any way. Uh, there, there, were, there were some departments, so there was a, a, a trial jury, jury trial manual that I was a consultant on, and that made sense. It went to the trial judges, it gave them all the practical motions, how to do voir dire, uh, what to do if there's Watson motions and, you know, uh, the things that we were familiar with as trial judges. And it was excellent for the new judge or it was excellent for a judge going from civil to the criminal side to, to fill in so they wouldn't make mistakes. And so the, the education component was important and judges need to be educated. But it went well beyond that into um, uh, other areas that, uh, that were really very, very, very questionable. You know. Well, that, uh, that's a good note, perhaps, <laughs> to end the interview. I want to, again, thank you for coming to the, coming over and, uh, and, and doing a second interview here. And uh, I want to thank David Knight for doing the uh, videotaping of the interview. Um, any final, final comments? No, that's it. No, no, no more emails from me. Uh, uh, let me thank both of you, uh, and especially Justice Reardon, for his time. Uh, and, his, uh, and, and his kindness today. And, and Dave, thank you for, for, for being here. Okay, good. All right, thanks, Jim. Sure. Good seeing you. Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah.